A very good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. And from our studios in London, I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Israel widens its ground offensive in Gaza as Prime Minister Netanyahu faces criticism for his unwillingness to accept responsibility for the Hamas attack. Meanwhile, Iran's foreign minister warns of new fronts against the U.S. if it continues to support Israel. HSBC announces a fresh buyback program despite announcing profits that missed estimates. CEO Noel Quinn tights capital strength in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg. An appetite for riskier assets recovers ahead of a long list of corporate earnings reports and a slew of central bank decisions from the Fed, the BOJ and the BOE. A very good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. We're just getting the German preliminary GDP data coming in across the terminal. It falls by 0.1% in the quarter. The estimate was for a drop of 0.2%. We, of course, we've already had North Rhine-West failure. Uh, inflation data coming in a little bit better than expected. Well, you've got the DAX uh, following the rest. The equity market is a little bit higher. Ten-year yields uh, flat at the moment, down uh, ever so slightly on that better than expected. North Rhine-West failure numbers, but no real reaction to the GDP and the euro dollar remaining unchanged. Let me take you through the rest of the market. So you have that narrative in Europe, uh, which is about inflation. But to the bond market, it is going to be about the size and the scale of refunding. Today, we're going to get the quarterly borrowing estimates. But the bond market's day of reckoning will come on Wednesday, according to Ain Lingen and a number of other market protagonists that say it is going to be about the Treasury and not the FOMC. In other words, the size of 10s, the size of 30s that you're going to get in terms of supply coming in across this market will define the next move. Crude oil drops by 1.85%. Do you believe that there is containment? That is the question. That is the fundamental question you must ask yourself when you look at the oil market. Do you believe that the Hamas-Israel war is contained or is there is a risk of it really, really expanding? And that is the assessment this morning, is that escalation fears drop. But is that enough in itself? Oil is down. The Iranian foreign minister, will hear from him later on, warning, very clearly warning, any continued support by America to Israel will simply involve an opening on major fronts. Hedge funds have slashed their positions uh, to the lowest in two months. And gold is down. The reason why I bring you gold is because gold has been this bell, I suppose, really phenomenal hedge. It has gone up by 9% since the Israel-Hamas attacks. And that is really the defense of all defenses as a hedge in this wartime. Danny, good morning. Good morning, Manis. And maybe as we flee gold, we go into risk. Let me quickly walk you through your equity market check. We are higher across the board this morning. Futures starting on the front foot up by more than half a percent. Perhaps not surprising considering we entered a correction at the end of last week. And we are on track for our worst October in five years. Lori Calvacina says the narrative from the earnings, it is bending, not breaking, breaking, but she calls the pessimism striking. That pessimism reflected in your VIX, it's just below 21%. Entering a second week above 20, though we are coming down ever so slightly. European stocks also doing better this morning, man, is up six tenths of 1%. HSBC, the earnings we're going to walk through with Tom Metcalf in just a few moments, but you can see that at the bottom of your screen shortly. HSBC shares fighting the propensity to move down on weaker earnings because they did issue a $3 billion buyback. But, Manis, as the kids get ready to don their Halloween costumes for trick or treating tomorrow for this bond market, it is spooky season, and you can groan at that all you want, but it is true. We've got, what, a Fed decision, BOJ, and a BOE decision, and the quarterly re -announcing, uh, uh, announcement that you mentioned, as well as payroll numbers. That is a lot to digest. I hope you've gotten your sleep because that is a wall of worry, or as Doug Ramsey at Luffield Group calls it, the wall of worry has morphed into, what, a slope of hope. Well, that's slope of hope. Don't worry, I'll be dying in Greenwich Village tomorrow night for the Halloween parade, uh, you know, fully decked out. I can't, I can't top Amory <laughs> Horden with her, with her Halloween <laughs> costume. I'll be wrapped up in bed at 6 p.m. tomorrow night. But on a slightly more serious note, what is the bid? What is the bid? S seriousness at, at 5 a.m. What is the bid to the bond market? The bid to the bond market is what the Bank of Japan might do. They could be that vortex, that mm. vacuum that sucks some liquidity out. The offer... Uh, on the other side, uh, sorry, it, it, you know, what you're looking at is that quarterly refunding. So I think it is a very, very delicate moment in the bond market. Ian Lingham was with us last week and he said this is a pivotal week and will define the top 
of the bond market. Where have we heard that before? But let's return to our top headline, Danny. Israel has ramped up its ground offensive in Gaza. This is President Biden holds a call with Prime Minister Netanyahu to underscore the need to protect civilians. This is as Iran warns of new fronts against the U.S. if the war drags on. I spoke to the Iranian foreign minister on Friday. Let's take a listen. If the United States continues what it has been doing so far, then new fronts will be opened up against the United States. In We'll hear more from the Iranian foreign minister later in the show, but some serious threats being raised if the ground offensive was of a significant size. Let's bring in Oliver Crook. He's back in Tel Aviv. Oliver, what is the latest over the weekend on the conflict? That's right, Manus. We enter now the fourth week of this war, of this conflict, and with it, a new chapter or a new stage, as Benjamin Netanyahu says. How do we define this new stage? It is marked by a greater ground incursion by the Israelis into Gaza, the most significant we've seen since the beginning of the war with tanks and soldiers. However, it still falls short of the full-scale invasion many had anticipated in the lead-up to this. So really the question is, what does this look like going forward? There is some ambiguity here, some of that by design, and we speak to officials, they say it could be six weeks weeks it could be six months again this is still developing and what we and why are they going about it this way for one thing, there are still two, more than 200 hostages being held by Hamas. There's international uh, pressure on the humanitarian front, but then there's also, as you've highlighted, that escalation risk. So we heard from the Saudis, the Emiratis over the weekend, who are condemning this new stage in the war. We've heard from the Iranians, who are speaking in many of the same terms we've heard throughout um, this crisis. But the question is really going to be, what is next? The U.S. sees uh, still a very elevated risk of escalation. And so where do we look at? We look at the northern border with Lebanon, still exchanges of fire there, not a huge step up, some strikes within Syria. But we also keep our attention, Mattis and Danny, on the West Bank, where we understand there are some clashes there. And we also understand from Lebanese news agencies that we will hear from the leader of Hezbollah for the first time at the end of this week on Friday in a televised address. Oliver, <clears throat> following the October 7th attacks, there was a unity government formed in Israel. But now we understand that Netanyahu is under pressure for his unwillingness to expect, accept rather responsibility for the attack. There was a deleted tweet over the weekend. Is, is there a sense that, that some of that unity has broken down? There's certainly rising pressure. And what's interesting is that it sort of came from Benjamin Netanyahu. So right after a press conference that was given by the three members of the war cabinet, one of whom is in opposition, right? So this was sort of a symbol of unity, this government coming together to wage this war. Netanyahu put out a tweet or an X saying basically that he had not been alerted to anything, that Hamas had been sort of deterred, according to all of the intelligence agencies, really shifting the blame onto the military and the intelligence agencies. This was taken extremely poorly, including from within the war cabinet. He deleted the tweet. He apologized. But again, the broader context, Benjamin Netanyahu is a very polarized figure within Israel. There are hundreds of thousands of people taking to the street every single week before <clears throat> this happened. And they really rallied behind the war effort. And now for him to do this was seen as a real sort of breach. And again, it makes it adds to sort of mounting pressure for the prime minister. Oliver, thank you very much. That is Bloomberg's Oliver Crook in Tel Aviv. All right, let's get you some of the other top stories this morning that are trending on the terminal. And, Manus, the UAW has expanded its strike against GM, now the only Detroit automaker without a deal with the union. Workers walked out of the plants in Tennessee on Saturday. Ford and Stellantis have both reached tentative deals, but now Stellantis is facing a strike in Canada after talks there failed with more than 8,000 workers. The former U.S. President Mike Pence has ended his presidential campaign, ending his quest to unseat the former running mate Donald Trump. Pence's campaign struggled amid a crowded field of candidates, lackluster funding and a low polling, despite his high name recognition, Danny. Now, Evergrande, the world's most indebted developer, has gained a final chance to get its restructuring back on track. A Hong Kong court has pushed back a winding up hearing to early December. Any eventual liquidation would make the company the biggest Chinese developer ever to face such a fate. Now, here in London, HSBC announced a new $3 billion buyback program despite reporting profit that missed the street's estimates. CEO Noel Quinn spoke exclusively with Bloomberg earlier today. We've got very strong capital generation at the moment. As you can see in today's results, um, we've also announced whether when we sell our Canadian bit business in Q1, it's our intention to do a further special dividend in Q1 of 21 cents. And then we'll consider what we do with the remaining proceeds of that um, 
that disposal. So I think we've got good capital generation this year and good capital generation prospects for the next 12, 24 months as well. I think we're in, in a good position. Joining us now on this is Bloomberg Finance Editor Tom Metcalf. Tom, as I mentioned at the top of the show, Lori Calvacina has called it striking how pessimistic investors have been around earnings. Here you have a company that missed, but its shares are higher, less than a percent, but, but they are higher today. Is it just the buybacks saving HSBC? Yeah, I think that's the big reason. Um, I mean, by and large, it was a positive update. And what we had Quinn saying actually earlier on Bloomberg TV was, hey, some of that miss was because we were taking some hedging strategy decisions that will pay back in future. And by and large, the market today is looking at this $3 billion of buyback and also looking ahead at that 12, 24-month period Quinn was just outlining. And I think, yeah, just about a positive story, uh, which is a rare one for banking at the moment. Yes. Tom, good morning. His old CFO used to say Noel went to bed happy at night so long as, Noel, so, so long as he was uh, worried about costs on his behalf. Um, commercial property. The question is, if you look at Standard Chartered's numbers and then you look at HSBC's numbers on commercial property, do you believe or can we trust that it's a solid call by Quinn? I mean, you've got a good exposure in commercial real estate. Would you be a buyer of his call, this is the bottom of the pain in commercial real estate? Yeah, it's really interesting just how different those two banks are coming out with on this particular matter. Standard Chartered results pretty much dominated um, by, you know, the sense that, wow, there is more pain to come in Chinese commercial real estate. But again, Quinn, very, very bullish. Uh, you know, they're not looking to take an impairment on, on sort of their assets in, in China in, in any great extent. And that's arguably, for me, the big difference between them and Standard Chartered this time round. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's going to be proven. He did basically call the bottom on, on a few calls with analysts. Um, but I think we'll find out who was right by the fourth quarter. I mean, I will say this for Quinn. He is a man of conviction. You know, when he says something, for better or for worse, yeah. you know, he is, a, he is a CEO, I think, who has grown into, Danny, a, a, you know, a formidable individual. He says, this is the way that I see it. This is my call. Yeah, and you know, I, I was just thinking the interesting contrast of him willing to call the bottom. I spoke to the Standard Charter CFO uh, last week, Andy Halford, who, who refused to call the bottom. He was like, it could be anywhere from two to four years. Well, you know, somewhere in the middle, there's going to there's going to be the truth. Although Andy Halford, a, along with his CEO, they've they've got some tough challenges themselves, not least how to fight off perhaps a Middle East takeover bid if it ever comes back. Just saying. Yeah. Tom, thank you very much. <laughs> Tom Metcalf there. <laughs> a touchy subject. Uh, Tom Metcalf on the very latest HSBC numbers. Speaking of HSBC, uh, we're going to catch up with Max Kettner, uh, Chief Multi-Asset Strategist from HSBC for, HSBC for a glimpse into 2024. And we will have more from my sit-down interview with the Iranian Foreign Minister. His warning to the US of Israel-Hamas war drags on right here on Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London. Manus Cranny is in New York. Now, HSBC's Max Kettner is going to give us a glimpse into 2024. He writes in his most recent note, it resembles a copy-paste exercise of the outlook for 2023, a flurry of downside risks to growth resulting in elevated global recession risks, developed market central banks cutting rates, and risk asset valuations being too high. We're joined now by the man himself. It is Max Kettner. Max, thank you so much for being here. All right, there you go. A glimpse into your research, a glimpse into 2024. It's interesting because you're overweight risk right now, which, I mean, it's, it's a fun time when that means you're a contrarian for being overweight yeah. risk. I mean, it's, it's been a punishing few months since July. Trillions wiped off this equity market. It's a difficult week for bonds. Mm. So what heralds the return of risk? I think what Harrods is, is um, when we look at the market internals, perhaps a little bit of subsiding volatility in rates. Right? Mm -hmm. If we look at bond market volatility, that's really explained most of the gyrations and equity multiples in particular in the last three and a half, almost four years now. Right? Ever since we've seen, or ever since the pandemic already kicked right. off, we've seen this big, big and tight correlation between equity multiples and, and bond market volatility on the other side. So I think, look, for me, it's not necessarily about, oh, yeah, yield will have to tank two and a bips or something, right, for equity multiples to expand again and for equities ultimately to return to, you know, a bit of, bit of upside and also for other risk assets, right, high yield credit and so on. But to me, it's really about bond market volatility to subside, right, a bit more certainty, a bit more stability, 
that already could actually be sufficient for multiples to expand and ultimately then for, for equities to rally as well. Mm. Max, okay. good morning. Yeah, so in. you're not looking for 200 basis points to rejuvenate your view on risk. But in terms of it was supposed to be the year of the bond, wasn't it? It was supposed to be the year of yield. As you go into 2024, how much, let's say, IG, HY and Sovereign, if, if 2024 might be a better year for bonds, where do I want to be positioned in that spectrum? Yeah, look, I think high yield credit, if you've got a multi-asset portfolio, right, with pretty much all the liquid assets, I think high yield credit still looks really, really good going into 2024, right? Really good because, um, and, and you guys were just, um, you know, uh, quoting what we said in our, our glimpse into 2024. Um, and, and, you know, I think now going into 2024, it's really, really unlikely that we are going to see massively different mm -hmm. outlooks for 2024, right? Like, like you were saying, a year ago, it was bonds are back and the year of yield and the return of carry or whatever they were called, the outlooks. It's really unlikely that suddenly everyone's going to be mega bullish on growth and mega bullish on risk assets and all these things, right? So most likely it's going to be pretty much more of the same, right? So then if I have a not really particularly steep maturity wall in high yield credit, if I've got mm -hmm. earnings, actually earnings delivery is still pretty good, particularly in the US, yeah, I'm fine with high yield credit, right? I personally, look, I'm getting paid 9%, right? And if you look at, you know, you look at defaults, fine, they're creeping up, right? But from extremely depressed levels, right? Okay. Then actually, high yield credit is still the place to be. But one of the things though, that confuses me is the macro data, which has been very strong, which I know it underpins some of this versus what companies are saying. Just looking through the reports we've gotten, Whirlpool says that customers aren't buying big appliances as much as they were. Harley Davidson weak sales. Invisalign says demand for teeth straighteners are down. Botox sales are down at Advy. I'd like to believe that we're less Botox vain, sales and that's are why down. sales no, are down. No. Yeah, Botox sales no. are. It's true, man. It's <laughs> is, that, is that a recession indicator? I don't know. Is, is that the is ultimate it? recession indicator? Is it? I thought maybe we're all coming down. So I'm not sure if that's maybe discretionary we, spending or non I, I don't know. Maybe don't know. we all Which over one? Botox yeah. coming out of COVID. Well, clearly, we're clearly I'm, I'm over to you, right? <laughs> clearly, so, you know. Max, we need the expression on your face. Don't go down the Botox route. I mean, come on. It, it, that can't be that we're all just changed our appetite for Botox. It does yeah. seem like there's a little bit of weakness that maybe we don't want wrinkles, but we're not willing to spend up to not have wrinkles. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I mean, I'm not a, like, you know, you will be very surprised to hear that I'm not a world-class expert in Botox spending. You'll be, you'll be surprised. Shocked, shocked Max. absolutely shocked, <laughs> I know. Um, but I guess, you know, in terms of what companies are saying relative to the macro data, in fact, what we've been seeing the last couple of quarters was, if you look at the frequency with which companies have talked about things like recession, things like inflation, it's actually dived like crazy, mm. right? It's really, really peaked sort of Q2, Q3 last year, and ever since, companies have, on aggregate, actually been a little bit more confident, right? And what we've seen, and that was a really, really interesting divergence, and I still think it's, it's sort of in place now, um, what we've seen is that the top-down leading indicators have always been very, very bearish, mm -hmm. right? And then really, really underpinning the sort of, oh, yeah, things are going to be really, really grim. Whereas companies, if you look at their sentiment, the conference call sentiment on aggregate, on earnings, on margins, on their own revenues, right? The stuff that they really mm -hmm. know about. That sentiment has actually been holding up really well in the last year and a half. And they've mm -hmm. been able to raise prices. And just for good order, this forehead hasn't moved much since 2015. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'll leave you with you that. I'll manners. leave you with that. That's a joke. That's a joke to the two of you. Max Kettner, thank you very much. Uh, he doesn't need he doesn't need Botox yet. He's too young. Max no. Kettner, nor nor does anybody else on this show. Uh, Max Kettner from HSBC, Danny Berger, my co-host every day. Uh, let's give you a quick snapshot. The dollar, the dollar could have a, a pretty frisky week. You've got uh, S&P futures, equity futures rising this morning. Uh, as you just heard from Max, he still wants to take risk in there. A uh, rolling across, you have the dollar down by an eighth of 1% this morning. It's going to be a big week. We'll hear about the quarterly refunding uh, this week. The Aussie is flying higher. Better retail sales, plus 0.9%, way ahead of what was estimated. Noel Quinn calls the bottom in commercial market. Dollar yen could be the absolute uh, a flyer of the week on the Bank of Japan tomorrow. Good morning from New York and London. This is Bloomberg Brief. Danny Berger in London, Manus Cranny in New York. 
A story that's caught our eye and apparently everyone's eye. This Manus is the most read story on the terminal this morning. Citadel's Ken Griffin has treated some 1,200 Asia-based staff and family to a three-day celebration of the company's anniversary at Tokyo Disney+. Plus. They also got performances from Maroon 5 and Calvin Harris. Griffin, of course, picked up the tab. Manus, how would you like an all-expenses trip to Disney with all of your favorite co-workers, including your favorite co-anchor, Danny Berger? It would be a, <laughs> to excuse the pun, it would be a whole new world. I think, I think, it would be, I think, I think it would be great. I mean, I just don't know, could I struggle with everybody's well how many kids went on that trip 300 kids went on that trip as well it's something like 300 it is yeah. disney i mean can you imagine yeah. the magic of disney uh you know it, it, it is a good lap it wouldn't be my preferred destination or trip but no. you know what actually i'd go anywhere with you danny Berger. there you go i go to the end oh, of the world with so you that's the sweetest thing you're ever going to hear out of me until we make a mistake. That is so sweet. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna make someone clip this up, and uh, when I invite you to Disney with me in Orlando, you're gonna have to say yes because you've said it here on live TV. A whole new world. <laughs>
against the U.S. if this war drags on. I sat down with the Iranian foreign minister on Friday. Let's take a listen. As long as the, the Syrian government, in order to fight uh, against terrorism, they ask us for help, and within the framework of our defense cooperation, we will act. Are you scaling up your troops to Syria? Are you sending more? Right now. If, the, uh, if it entails, I mean, if fighting against the terrorism, for that, the, the go Syrian government asks us to do that, and we, 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 we already have. Have they asked you for more troops? You already have. Yeah, when they were fighting ISIS, Syria asked us. I'm talking us, about since October the 7th. And we acted the 7th. upon that. Have you sent more troops since October the 7th to Syria? Uh, no, I don't, I, I don't think so. The Gulf? Are you sending more naval vessels to the Gulf? Uh, are, are, are you putting me on trial or interviewing no, me? No, I am trying to understand. Respectfully, Minister, I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to understand the difference between, I suppose, escalation and de-escalation, and I think the world wants to understand where you are okay. in terms of your assets. As bad as after October. Uh, after the uh, 7th of October, how many uh, weapons, American uh, troops and weapons have been sent to, to Tel Aviv? Can you give me the number? Uh, how, how many aircrafts, uh, uh, trucks, uh, what, kind of, what foreign, kind of weapons? You are the foreign minister. I, I would expect you, sir, to have access to that information. I am simply a journalist. I'm trying to understand for our Bloomberg audience what the state of play is in the world. And with that in mind, sir, you have obviously been very critical of these, of these additional troops and additional deployments to the region. And I want to understand, for example, you have a great influence as a nation over the trade routes of, of the world in the Persian Gulf, uh, in the Red Sea. But our audience will want to know, will you be a protector of those trade lines or a disruptor? That's what I'm trying to get an answer to. We have not dispatched any new forces, any new troops to neither Syria nor Iraq or to other parts of the region. But we are not just uh, like onlookers. We have not just been uh, watching the developments. A any time that that we think is necessary, proportionate to and in accordance with our national interest and situation of the region, at the, at the right time and place, the Islamic Republic of Iran will will make the decision. But I would like to warn right here that the continuation of the situation, the continuation of the killing of the people in Gaza and women and children will, will make the situation get out of control in the region. That was Iran's foreign minister with me in New York on Friday evening. Joining us now in studio is Bobby Ghosh, our Bloomberg opinion columnist. Bobby, good of you to join Danny and I this morning. Um, we're trying to understand the state of play. A, a, a great deal is happening. He was warning about the U.S. backing of uh, Israel, that undivided backing. I did push him in terms of, are you warning the people of the United States of America in country? Uh, he was very clear a major escalation of this war would open on all fronts mm. for him. Of course, you've got to ask yourself what strength and control he still has with Hezbollah uh, and, and Hamas. Where are we in terms of the global geopolitic for Israel? Good morning. Good morning, uh, and thanks for having me. Well... You know, I, I, I was watching that clip with interest. The most charitable thing you can say about, about the foreign minister of Iran is that he was being disingenuous. Uh, Iran uh, does not fight directly against Israel. It uses an assortment of different Arab proxies. Iran is quite happy to fight Israel until the last Arab. That's, that's been true for, for a couple of decades now. Um, the fact that they every so often an Iranian official comes up and, and, th and warns about the ex escalation and expansion of the conflict should be taken very seriously. Um, but even that's if, how they deliver terror, isn't it? Exactly that is, that right. is the personification of terror. That's exactly right. They use terror groups like Hamas, like Hezbollah, the Houthis, uh, the, the Shiite groups in, uh, in, 
Iraq. And they have already been ratcheting up uh, the activities of these groups. There have been missiles being fired all the way from Yemen to Israel. So it's, it's one thing for him to say, we're not sending more forces. The whole, the whole trick is they don't have to send more forces. They have local proxies that they have cultivated, trained, armed, financed for decades that they can use to deploy whenever it suits them. So, so Bobby, and, and, and great to see you this morning. So when he talks about the U.S.'s involvement, saying things like the U.S. Uh, is running the war and, and the threats he expressed with Manus and earlier on about the U.S. should back away from their involvement or, or face that kind of escalation, is that threat then more concentrated on, you say, as those sort of proxy groups or, or something more direct, something more... I don't know, pernicious between directly Iran and the U.S.? Should we make that of those types of threats? No, I think the use of proxy groups is the most pernicious part of it if, because the Iranians can always use somebody else's shoulders from which to fire at the United States, and, and whether it's directly uh, against U.S. targets or the targets of U.S. allies in the region. Israel, of course, the UAE, Saudi Arabia. Uh, there are plenty of points in the Middle East that Iran can attack and hurt the United States, hurt our allies, um, and hurt the global economy. This has been the threat that Iran has posed for many, many years, and, and that has not changed. I can't imagine uh, that Iran will directly get involved in this fight, uh, because whenever they have done so, it has been to great cost to the Iranian people and the Iranian nation. Um, and as long as they have other people to do their fighting, why bother get involved directly? Well, we did actually touch on his, his visit to Qatar, the mm. $6 billion, the hostage exchange. We touched on his, his lobbying, in theory, with Hamas to release the civilian hostages, and that that came up a couple of weeks ago in, in Qatar. Um, can we just pivot to the U.S. side? We have mm. funding. Uh, we have a new Speaker of the House. Therefore, we will see a, an accelerated program on war funding, defense funding, uh, for Israel and Ukraine. But it looks as if, in the first instance, that this is going to be split in two. What size of funding and, and, and how important a message is that to the world that America stands with Israel but not with Ukraine in terms of funding? Because that is the takeaway message if the funding is split. That is how the, the rest of the world will see it, and that is how the that's White how House... Russia will see it. And Russia, and that's how the White House would like the rest of the world to see it. I mean, the, this framing of putting the, the Ukrainian funding and the Israeli funding together in one... This is President Biden's framing. You remember the speech from last yes. week in which he put these two things together. He made the argument that these are part of a continuum, that these are part of threats to the United States that need to be looked at as a whole rather than individually. So, yes, there will be a perception outside of the U.S. that uh, there is a softening of America's support for Ukraine. This comes at a particularly bad time. Mm -hmm. The big question is whether the Europeans step up and increase their support for Ukraine, whether that burden, if you like, can be shared with European allies, other NATO allies, where, where they take up uh, the, the, the sort of heavy load of supporting Ukraine while the United States, for a little time anyway, supports Israel. Bobby, on the ground in Israel and in Gaza, the way that's been characterized of the current approach is instead of a massive ground invasion, a slower day by day, taking it an approach based on casualties. The market has interpreted that approach one way as, as de-escalation seeming to play itself through these oil markets. But does that kind of approach change the narrative at all of Israel's war against Hamas? Oh, I'm afraid that, that, that events on the ground are moving too quickly for us to take a sort of safe position on that. Uh, I, I, if I were uh, sort of in the oil futures business, I would not be so sanguine. I think events are changing even as we speak. Uh, that I, I, it has been remarkable that Israel has not gone in, that, that sort of ground invasion that we've been expecting for three weeks has not yet taken place. But I can't imagine that... that Do you think Netanyahu like still that. has the global support for that, uh, that open-ended global support? No, he has not. A lot of that support that we saw in the first few days after the October 7th attack have sort of, has sort of faded away. But he still has substantial support okay. within Israel. There's, a, there's an appetite within Israel for vengeance, for a reckoning on what happened on the 2nd of October. And that's going to guide his actions more than anything else. Okay, Bobby, thank you so much for uh, getting up early this Monday morning to uh, give us the context on the Hamas-Israel war. Uh, Bobby Ghosh, Bloomberg opinion columnist. You can pick up his opinion 
on the Bloomberg Terminal. Coming up with Danny and myself, brace, brace, brace. Heck of a week, jolts, jobs, refunding, all to play for in the bond and equity markets right here on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger in London, Manus Cranny in New York. And the bond market has a lot to digest this week. The BOJ is going to kick off a string of rate decisions tomorrow. And here's what Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohammed El Arian said on the Bank of Japan's YCC. He wrote that while there is no guarantee that the central bank will be able to chart an orderly exit, it runs a greater risk of fueling unsettling volatility by maintaining the current overly measured approach and calls for them to exit YCC. Joining us now is Bloomberg and Live Cross Asset strategist Ven Ram. Ven, it makes sense what Elarian is talking about, the distortion caused by YCC, but does the Bank of Japan really care about the wider bond market distortion, or are they just going to focus on their inflation targets for any adjustment when it comes to YCC and wider monetary policy? I think El Arian has, a, has got a fantastic point there. I do think that you know, the Bank of Japan is going to increasingly feel the pressure if they continue to keep the uh, 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 the yields contained at this at the current point because you've got 10-year tre treasury yield surging past around 5%, hovering around 5%, and you've got less than 1% yield on the JGB. That's not that's not tenable in the long run at all. And the POJ is kind of acutely aware of it because they've been in, coming into the bond market to, to defend the curve control on quite a number of occasions this month, and they can't continue with it for the simple reason. With corporate bond uh, corporate bond spreads tend to blow out, and then corporates can't come into the market and issue new bonds. So all that causes market dislocation, and that uh, that at some point the BOJ will think that you know you know what it's not worth defending the bond market here, to to the to the point where market dislocations begin to widen out. So I think that mm. the Bank of Japan is acutely aware of that. The question is when, though. I don't think they will do anything on uh, negative rates this week, but they may, we may get some kind of modification of the permissible range on which 10-year yields can trade. Ben, good to see you. I, I mean, I think if they do anything or, or, or at all on yield curve control, it'll be, it'll be like just ripping a big vacuum cleaner uh, and it, it'll just suck a huge amount of liquidity. Um, that's just me. What about this quarterly refunding from the Fed? I've got BMO telling us that it's going to be the most significant moment for the bond market. Never mind your FOMC, never mind your jobs report. Um, it's going to be all about the Treasury refunding. Do you agree it's going to be that capacity to usurp the other data points? Yes, I, I do think that there's a fair bit of argument to be made in, fun, made in favor of the Treasury refunding announcement being the more important thing, because at least this week, because you know the Fed is going to be on hold. They are not going to raise rates anymore at this point. They're quite restrictive enough. The other point is that, yes, we get the labor market data. We have already known that the labor market is pretty strong. We already know that the jobless rate is only 3.8%. The Fed thinks that they need a rate, uh, jobless rate of 4.2%, 4.3% to nudge the labor market into balance. And we are not going to get that any point soon. Mm -hmm. So those two, with those two known unknowns already there, uh, the only other point of interest for the markets is the refunding announcement. And mm. we just got the deficit figures last week. And we, that was a doubling of the deficit. And we also got the GDP numbers last week, 4.9%. That's fantastic growth. So if you look at all those things, the right. next focus for the markets is how much more is the Treasury going to issue to defend this deficit? And, and then the M MLI per poll survey released over the weekend has a search for that uh, ever, ever looked for neutral rate. And it has it doubling at least 100 basis points, again, uh, according to respondents from the pre-pandemic levels. What are the, what's the impact of that? Because that doesn't seem like something that's been fully digested or, or at least attempted to be digested in this market. 
Absolutely. I think that's being underappreciated by the markets to a large extent. And that's why so many po portfolio positioning, so much of portfolio positioning has gone all right this year, simply because people haven't grasped the truth, the reality of the neutral rate. If the neutral rate is higher, real yields are going to be higher as well. And we have seen real rates go from the 10-year real rate in the U.S. has gone from zero to 240 basis points at the moment as we speak. That's a phenomenal surge by any stretch of imagination and if that continues nominal rates are going to go higher as well which is why despite all the tensions in the middle east we we haven't really seen the 10-year treasuries or the 30-year tre treasuries rally despite all the tensions and i think that there is a message for the markets that they are still under appreciating okay uh, well let's see that f that uh, treasury funding announcement on where it is on the 10s and 30s will be uh, irksome one could say uh, to the yields. Ven, always good to get you with us. Ven Ram, uh, our Bloomberg um, live team. Coming up, a look at some of the market moving events to watch out for this week. You're going to get that Treasury funding, you're going to get the jolts, you're going to get the jobs report. S&P futures uh, trying to claw their way back. Uh, we went into correction on the spoos, correction on the Nasdaq. The dollar's down by an eighth of 1% as the equity markets has decided in its infinite wisdom at 5.51 a.m to be risk on. Will that endure is the question. Oil is down on containment hopes rather than facts in the in the conflict in Israel Hamas war right here on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Manish Cranny in New York. Now let's get you set up for your trading day with a look at what's ahead this week. It is a big week of central bank decisions. It's going to kick off with the BOJ on Tuesday, then the Fed on Wednesday and the BOE on Thursday. Plus, is the quarterly refunding announcement going to be the big one? Of course, from the U.S. Treasury, it comes just hours ahead of the Fed's rate decision on Wednesday. And finally, Manis, we're going to round out the week with Apple earnings on Thursday, and then we get the U.S. jobs report on Friday. But first, we have McDonald's early earnings today. You, you fancy yourself a bit of fast, fast food, Manis? I get dropped off outside McDonald's every morning. I've got to say around the corner from here, <laughs> but I come in and I have my low-fat yogurt and berries at 2.32 a.m. in the morning. There it's you go. It's too early for McDonald's. It's too early for anybody <laughs> to know what, what, what we have for breakfast at 2.30 in the morning. Um, of course, we've got to keep an eye on the UAW and, uh, you know, whatever resolution there may be in the United States of America, it's crosses borders. Mm. Stellantis workers in Canada, Danny, they're on strike. Uh, talks fail. Ford's uh, deal includes $8 billion uh, in plant investments, according to the UAW. But north of the border is where you want to really keep an eye on. Danny, revert back to the oil market. I mean, we're down a buck 18 at the moment. Um, and I think that this is where we're going to really focus in. So right now, the oil market believes that there's, there's a limited and targeted approach by Israel. It seems to have gone into this quasi state of not pause, but a less significant ground, all out ground offensive that was originally Anticipa anticipated. And the Bloomberg survey says the Saudis will pause their price hikes. Mm. Right, but we're just speaking with uh, Bobby Ghosh of Bloomberg Opinion, who says if he was an oil trader, he wouldn't want to be making that bet, just given how quickly things change day to day on the ground. All right, that's it for us on Brief Surveillance. Up ahead.